Lord, we also want to pray for those in our assembly that can't be with us. I think of Miss Murtis and Charles and Fanita, and we just ask that you encourage them as it's a better part of wisdom right now with their health to, to be where they are and just ask that you help us to be faithful friends to them, even remotely. We thank you, God, for the way that they've influenced us over the years and all that they've done for us and just ask especially that you encourage them this morning. God, we do thank you for your word. It's, uh, I think Pastor Matthew, Sam, and Vivi were saying they heard 20 sermons this, this week at the weekend at the G3 conference. And Father, uh, your word is, it is an encouragement to us. We love to understand it and to stand upon it. We know it's the seed that goes into us and is mixed with faith and produces life and growth. And so we're, we're thankful for that, Lord. We ask that you do grant us your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Spirit. Help us to walk by your Spirit, Father, so that we have the means that we need to walk in the manner that you've called us to. And today, Father, as always, every Sunday, we ask that this be a means, this be the way that you encourage and grow us and strengthen us for the days ahead to continue in the faith and to love each other and ultimately to love you with all of our heart. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I hope uh, you turned earlier to Psalm 74. If you did, stay there. If you didn't, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to do that myself as well. While I'm turning, I think I have a slide here. Uh, just to introduce my friend Sam. And his wife Vivi. So this is a picture taken about 15 years ago, maybe the last time I saw Sam. And uh, we, uh, Sam's from Mumbai, I think. It, we met in, in seminary together and became fast friends. Uh, he's an engineer, aerospace, I think. And uh, was that right? Aeronautical. Aeronautical engineering. I was computer engineering. So we had a lot in common and uh, became friends. Sam, uh, we also continued on and studied a Master's of Theology in Old Testament, so we had a lot of classes together and got to know each other. He surpassed me. I think he continued on and got his doctorate, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I tapped out uh, before <laughs> then. Uh, and Sam lived, Sam and Vivi lived in Palm Springs, two and a half hours away from seminary. They were, uh, and so Sam would drive in and uh, on a Tuesday morning, early Tuesday morning, and he would spend the night at our house uh, on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, go to class Thursday and drive back home to be with his family. And my kids were little. Willem was a baby. And, you know, they would get up, Hannah and Susanna would get and set up the mattress out for him and set up the blankets and everything and then go to bed. And I guess Sam came in that night and slept, but in the morning he was gone. So they never met him, even though he was with us for so long because he worked so hard. He was at the library all night and he would get up before any of us. Um, so anyways, Willem, hopefully you can meet Sam for the first time while he's here. But anyways, uh, just really good. I haven't seen Sam in 15 years. He's pastor at Family Heritage Church in La Quinta, California. They're here for the conference and then are going to spend a couple days vacationing together before they head back. So y'all make sure you welcome Sam. But I wanted to uh, show this picture of Sam and Steve and I, some friends from, from back in school. Uh, David was at G3. I pulled this off of Denise's Facebook page. Uh, David was at G3, so even though our normal routine is for David to lead us through Second Peter on Sunday morning, we've been doing that for quite a while now uh, to give him a rest, but he had quite a lot of responsibilities at G3. So I'm going to preach for the next three weeks, uh, next three Sundays for us. Here's the, the plan. I don't know if you can read that. If not, uh, hopefully you've got it on your mobile device. If not, tap somebody else and ask them how to get it, and we can we can get it for you. But this is the plan over the next three weeks. We meet on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. So we're the goal uh, is to be is to study and understand Hosea three. That's the ultimate goal is to understand that. Today we won't even open to Hosea. Uh, I want to just set the context for why it's important. Why was Hosea three even written? What's the what's the use? What is uh, what can we learn from it? Why did God inspire it and include that in the scriptures? So that's what we'll do today. We'll set a lot of context. I'll be out of town Wednesday, so David is going to cover Psalm 79 for us, which is a psalm very similar to the one we read this morning. Uh, the next week we'll get into Hosea. I'll introduce Hosea. We'll talk a little bit about it, particularly because prophecy is hard, right? We all know that. We're going to track down two clues uh, that might help us in, understand and interpret Hosea 3 well. And then the following Wednesday night, we'll cover Hosea 2 together. That's the, the non-narrative part. It's a little bit harder than Hosea 1 and 3. 
Uh, so we'll, we'll study that a little bit together Wednesday night, and then the following uh, Sunday we'll go ahead and cover Hosea 3 and see what it, what, it, what it means and what we can learn from it, including how we can benefit from it, not just in knowledge, but in, in how we walk, uh, in particular in our marriages, uh, for those of us that are married. So then we'll get back to Second Peter the following week. David will be back in our normal routine. So that's, that's the plan. That's where we're going. And uh, today we're going to start, as I mentioned, by sort of setting the context. Why are we studying Hosea 3? What's the importance? Uh, how can we sort of prepare for that? And we're going to do it by looking initially at Psalm 74, which we've already read this morning. So again, please make sure you turn there. Uh, we're going to just briefly look at it together uh, and then go on from there. So this psalm, uh, was written after the destruction of Israel by Assyria and then Babylon. And complete devastation, as you know, if you've read anything about how Assyria treated their enemies or how Babylon specifically treated Jerusalem and Judah, complete devastation, completely destroyed the temple and all the towns. <coughs> I mentioned on Wednesday night in Isaiah's prophecy, he said, you know, if it wouldn't have been when Assyria came, if it wouldn't have been for the Lord's grace, you know, Everything would have been destroyed, and as it were, even in that, Jerusalem was left like a, a cucumber, a hut in a cucumber field. It's like you know, everything around had been raised, had been burned to the ground, and Jerusalem alone was left. And so, ultimately, Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. And this psalm is written after the fact. It's written if you look in verse two, where he says, "This Mount Zion." So it seems like it's written by somebody who's been away to exile, who's been away to Babylon, and has come back. So this is years after they've been destroyed. They're back in Jerusalem. They're praying to the Lord. What's, what, what's next, God? Are you, have you completely forsaken us? Because you allowed our enemies to destroy us. Yes, we went out to exile. We're back. But have you forgotten? Because it doesn't seem like the glory is coming back. He says in verse 1, Have you rejected us forever? Have you forgotten? He says... The ruins are perpetual in verse 3. Everything within the sanctuary was destroyed. All of it, verse 6. All the carved works, are, verse 7, burned to the ground. So he's back. They're back in the land, but, but everything still seems destroyed. It seems like God has not come back and redeemed and restored them. You go to verse 18. Skip down to verse 18. He says, don't forget, remember, remember the covenant that you made. Right? Israel was in a covenant relationship. They were God's special people. And, and yes, they were disciplined because of their sin, but they're back, and there's an expectation and a hope that God is going to renew and restore them. He says in verse 19, Don't forget the life of your afflicted forever. Verse 20, Consider your covenant. Remember the covenant that you have with us. Verses 22 and 23, Don't forget. Remember. So the psalmist is expecting the glory to come back, the glory of God in the midst of Jerusalem, the glory of Israel among the nations, the fact that they were God's special people and, and were not looking like it. What, what, where was that? When was that going to come back? How long until that was going to happen? And it seems like there's no answer. It seems like the psalmist is, is still left to just struggle and wonder. And so we ask the question, maybe God had forgotten the covenant. Has, maybe, he, maybe they shouldn't expect restoration or redemption. Why? Why does this psalmist expect that? Why does he expect that God would restore them to that glory? Remember back, and a lot of you are new and won't remember this. Some of you are new and won't remember this. I'll, I'll give a little bit of detail. But remember our study of kings, and I'll show you a couple of uh, slides from that. You remember, remember when we talked about these two phrases, and I said, "Hey, what does this phrase mean to you?" And you said, "Hey, well, you know, a fairy tale starting. You know, a story starting, or you know, a, a one is ending." And I said, "Really? You figured that out just from those few words?" And yeah, right? Those are catch words. We know when we read them what's starting or what's ending. And we said, hey, Hebrew has a very similar thing. They have these, these phrases. And they can, in the same way that happily ever after or um, once upon a time signals to you that something's happening, there, there's the same idea in Hebrew. Just a short couple of words that say, hey, something new is happening. And you remember we walked through all the different covenants together. We started with the Noahic. And we walked through, remember the Noahic covenant was made, but the people failed. They didn't fail, they didn't obey God, they didn't do what he said. And so ultimately God judges them and renews the covenant with them in the Abrahamic covenant. He calls Abraham out and he starts a new 
he, he, he makes a new arrangement with them and, and renews covenant. We said, hey, that happened when Abraham failed. He was waiting for the promise that God had made to him of a, of a large nation to come from him, of many sons. And he, he failed. He waited impatiently and took Hagar, right? And ultimately, um, you know, God renews the covenant with Abraham. He comes down in a theophany and he makes that covenant with Abraham. But after that, he calls another people out in the Mosaic covenant. And we went through each of these. I'm not going to repeat our lesson from Kings, but we went through each of these and he did the Deuteronomy covenant the second time, even after the people had failed to go into the land from there. Joshua, he renews covenant with Joshua in the land. He renews covenant with Samuel, even after they asked for a king and reject the Lord. And finally, after the Saul's disobedience, he renews and makes a covenant with David. And again, we went through those in details and you can find those on the website. But the point I want to make here is God continually, every time after they would fail, would make a new covenant with them, right? And the, we learned in the Davidic covenant, the same thing happened where there was failure again, failure on the part of David and taking Bathsheba, failure on the part of Solomon and taking many wives and not obeying the Lord and turning his heart to idols, right? And so even the Davidic covenant was not being upheld by God's people. God certainly upheld his side, but God's people were not upholding their side of the covenant. And you'll remember, again, in our study of Kings, those of you who were there, if not, I'll, I'll give a little details just to to remind you, in fact, go ahead and turn in your Bibles, keep your finger on Psalm 74, but turn to 1 Kings. You remember as the outworking of David and Solomon's failure was just getting worse and worse in Israel. Turn to 1 Kings 18. You'll remember that the nation just began to spiral downward. The, the kings were not faithful to God. The, the terms of the Davidic covenant were not being withheld. God had said, hey, if you're faithful to me, I'll bless you. You'll never lack a man to sit on the throne. But if not, I'm going to discipline you. And sure enough, they needed discipline. And it was getting really bad to the point where in 1 Kings 18, Ahaz and Jezebel were reigning in the north. And Baal worship, worship of idols, was rampant and, and was the national religion, as it were. But in 1 Kings 18, there was a massive turning point, remember? And it was Elijah on Mount Carmel, defeating the, the 450 prophets of Baal and fire coming down. And, and really a turning point where Elijah called on the people to recognize that the Lord was God. But you remember from that study, or let me introduce it for those of you who weren't here. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah runs to Mount Horeb, right? After that, he runs to Mount Horeb in 1 Kings 19. And you ask yourself, why did he do that? Well, sure, he was running from Jezebel, but why did he go to Mount Horeb? Right? And we talked through that. And remember, for just a second, when he gets to Mount Horeb in, in 1 Kings 19, verse 10, where he says, God says to Elijah, why are you here? Why did you come to Mount Horeb? And he says, God, I've been very zealous for you, but all of Israel has forsaken your covenant, and I'm left. I'm, I alone am left. And God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. But, but I want you to look a couple verses before verse 10 in chapter 19. And notice on Elijah's way there that he's fed in the wilderness supernaturally with bread and water as he's going through the wilderness. What does that remind us of? Who else was fed in the wilderness supernaturally with bread and water? Israel, Israel right? Okay, in verse 8, he's at Mount Horeb. Who else had been at Mount Horeb at a special time in their time in their history? Israel, right? They they left Egypt, and where did they go? Mount Horeb. And what happened on Mount Horeb? What did God give to them? The, the Ten Commandments, the covenant. He made the covenant with them, right? How about verse 8? Elijah went 40 days and nights without eating, without drinking. Who does that remind you of? Jesus. Who before him? Moses. Moses, right? On that same, ter on that same trip. He goes in verse 9 into a cave, right? And then in verse 11, the Lord passes by. Does that remind you of anything? Right? Moses, again, when he passed by and declared his name. So clearly, if you'll recall from our study, there is an expectation here that the covenant, a covenant is going to be renewed. A covenant is going to be made. The Davidic has been broken. It's time for God to renew covenant. And what better person than Elijah to do this? What an amazing prophet. Just won this massive victory over the uh, prophets of Baal. God just sent fire down from heaven. And here's this prophet on Mount Horeb with all these remembrances of when God made covenant with Moses in the past. Surely God is going 
to make and renew covenant with Israel. And you'll recall, let me just show you here, every time God made a covenant with these with the nation of Israel, he would come down in what we call a theophany. He would come down in a glorious presence, whether it was when he was making it with Samuel. You remember when he made it with Moses? They couldn't even get near the mountain because God's glory came down. And what do we have in verse uh, 11 of chapter 19 of 1 Kings? What do we have? We have a great wind, an earthquake, and a fire. So it sure looks like God is going to come down and renew covenant with them, right? But what does the text specifically say? He's not in it. The Lord wasn't in those things, right? So everything in us as readers is saying, this is going to be the renewal of covenant. And everything else very explicitly is, no, I'm not renewing covenant with you. In fact, Elijah, he asks again in verse uh, 14, Elijah, when, it, when all is said and done, there's just a still voice, which really means sheer silence. There's no, no word from God. He says in verse 13, Elijah, what are you doing here? Go back and anoint Elisha, and he goes back. No covenant is renewed, right? And he goes back and he anoints Elisha. And you'll see on this slide that we have that same phrase at the beginning of 2 Kings, that same Hebrew phrase that indicates something is happening that came about after the death of Ahab, and Elisha is introduced. And you think, well, here's the guy then that God is going to renew covenant with. He's going to renew it with Elisha. And oh, by the way, He's anointed, just like David was anointed. And, oh, when he found him, he was out plowing oxen, just like Saul was when, the, when, the, when he was anointed king. And so everything in you, again, says Elisha is going to be the one that God renews covenant with, with Israel. But Elisha, he does some local miracles. He makes an axe head float. He, he does a number of amazing things, but no covenant is ever made. And he passes off the scene. And what happens at the end of 2 Kings? The destruction of the nation. No covenant is ever renewed. God refuses to have patience and mercy with them again. And they're destroyed. And so maybe the psalmist back to 74 shouldn't expect renewal. I mean, on the one hand, God always was patient with them. He would always forgive them. He would always renew covenant with them. But maybe the last straw has been broken. <coughs> Because he, he refused to do it. He refused to renew covenant with them. He destroyed them. Now they're back in the land. But should they expect a restoration? Well, the reality is, a thousand years earlier, almost a thousand years before that, God had already promised through Moses, before any of this disobedience even happened, he had promised that he would, one last time, restore them and forgive them. In Deuteronomy 28, it's a very, a very well-known chapter. God lays out the covenant blessings and curses that he's going to make with the people of Israel. And one of the things he said in verse 64 of 28 is, when you disobey, ultimately I'm going to scatter you among all the four corners of the earth. I'm going to scatter you throughout the world. Deuteronomy 28, 64. So this was predicted. We knew that was going to happen. He says, Yahweh will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods which you or your fathers have not known. But he also predicted through Moses in Deuteronomy 30 that when all these things come upon them, when they get scattered, when they are experiencing the curse, and when they're in all the nations that they've been driven, and they call these things to mind, that if they return to Yahweh their God and obey him with all their heart and soul, according to all that Moses was commanding them that day, then Yahweh will restore you from captivity, have compassion on you, so he will have compassion one more time, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh your God has scattered you. Even if you're outcast or at the ends of the earth, from there Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. And the psalmist was back. They were back in the land. And now he's saying, How long, God? Will you renew us? Because look at what he said. I'll read to you. I didn't ask you to turn. Deuteronomy 30, verse 5. He's going to give them more than they had before. He said, Yahweh, your God, will bring you into the land which your fathers possess. You will possess it. He'll prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. I mean, that's hard to believe. The prosperity of Solomon and the, the glory of Israel, he's going, to, he's going to prosper them even more than that. The amazing victories of Joshua, their prosperity in the future is going to be greater than that. In fact, 
Yahweh is going to circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you may live. He's going to fix the problem that they had. They didn't have the capability to obey, and he's going to give them that capability. So it was right, despite God's refusing to renew covenant with them because they had failed so many times, and despite the just discipline he had given them, he had promised almost a thousand years before that there would be a restoration. There would be one more time when he would come, he would bring them back, he would have compassion on them, and he would give them a new heart. So it is right for the psalmist to wonder, back in the land, how long? When, God? When? Have you forgotten? It seems like you've forgotten. Year goes by, year goes by, and nothing has changed. There's no prophets, there's no miracles, there's no signs. When? Now, it wasn't just Moses that had declared that this was going to be something that God does for them. I want to show you the latter prophets. In that same study on Kings, we talked about the former and the latter prophets. The latter prophets being Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve, what we sometimes refer to as the minor prophets. Well, the latter prophets came along that same time during Kings, and they said, yes, God is going to judge you. Yes, the day of the Lord is near. Yes, God is going to judge you. But here is what God is going to do one more time. Jeremiah said, God is going to do, he's going to make for you a new covenant. He's going to make a new covenant for you. He's going to, I don't have it here. I have it on the screen, but I don't have this in front of me, so I'm going to turn. He says, days are coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them out of Egypt, the covenant that they broke, even though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant that I'll make, declares Yahweh, with Israel after those days. I'm going to put my law in them. I'm going to be, I'm going to write it on their heart, and I'm going to be their God, and they'll be my people. So again, they not only had Moses telling them that, they had Jeremiah saying that. He said, here's what is God going to do? And they had Isaiah saying, here's who God is going to do it with. Jeremiah told them what God was going to do. Isaiah said, here's who God is going to covenant with you through. It's going to be this servant, in particular this servant who's going to come, and he's going to suffer, but he's going to be the one I make the covenant with you through him. I'm going to make the covenant with you, and not just with you, Israel, but for all nations. Isaiah shared that with them. And Ezekiel came in and shared the where. Where is God going to do that? They've been scattered. Well, he's going to bring them back to the land. He's going to bless them in the very land that they were expelled from. And Ezekiel even has a vision of the new and glorious city and temple where God's going to do that. So again, the psalmist had every right to expect He had had firm standing to expect that something was going to be done by God. He was going to restore them there in the land. But they wondered when, and it sure did seem like God wasn't responding. It seemed like he had forgotten. Now, there was another exile, another uh, well-known exile beyond the psalmist who was asking the same question, who was wondering the same thing. And if you were here Wednesday night, you don't get to answer. I know we already said this, but who was who was that other exile who was also wondering when God would do this? A famous exile. He didn't come back. He was still serving in the government of the land where he had been taken. David. You almost had it. Daniel, right? Daniel. Daniel. I knew that's what you meant. Yeah, Daniel. Daniel was a little different. Daniel had risen to power, right? And he stayed and uh, and ultimately served the king of Babylon and then the kings of Persia. Turn, turn to Daniel 9 with me. Daniel was wondering the same question, was wondering the same thing as the psalmist. He wanted to know when God would do this. He knew the book of Moses. He knew the law of Moses. He knew uh, that, the, that Moses had promised of this restoration, this new heart that would come. And Daniel wanted to know as well. And Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah. Daniel was reading what Jeremiah had written in chapter 9 of Daniel. And while Daniel was serving the king of, uh, of Persia or Media, whilst Daniel was serving Darius, he's reading verse 2 of chapter 9 in the books of Jeremiah that were written by him the number of years that had been revealed as the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem. Daniel wants to know how long, when will we be restored? And he's reading Jeremiah and he goes, there it is. There it is, it's 70 years, right? And here's the the verse from Jeremiah 29. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles. And he basically tells them, I want you to 
build houses, plant yourselves in Babylon. It's going to be a while. Pray for the prosperity of that city. Stay there because you're not coming back. There were prophets in those days who were saying, hey, you're going to come back next year. Like this is a temporary thing. God's going to deliver you. And Jeremiah said, no, you're going to be there for a good 70 years, he says. Don't let your prophets who are in your midst deceive you. Don't listen to them and the dreams they dream. They're prophesying falsely to you. I haven't sent them. And he says, for when 70 years have been completed, then I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. So 70 years, he said. So Daniel, in about 539 BC, is reading the prophet Jeremiah, observing that, and saying, hey, it's been 70 years. Now's the time. Right? And so that's what Daniel 9 is about. He starts praying to the Lord. He says, God, you are very right in what you did. We deserve to be disciplined. You deserve to not have compassion on us. You deserved. You had promised you would. And you did what was right and just. In fact, you'll see in verse 13 of chapter 9, he even references the law of Moses. Again, Daniel knew this was the what was written. God had already said ahead of time, this is what he would do. But then in verses 15 to 19, Daniel prays in the exact same way as the psalmist of Psalm 74. He says, Now, O Lord our God, who has brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, we've sinned, we've been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, now let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. It's because, For because of our sins and the iniquities of our father, Fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Remember the psalmist, how desolate the sanctuary was, how they had raised it completely. Verse 18, God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see. Do you see, God? Can you remember what you had promised? See the desolations in the city, which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. Lord, hear, forgive. Lord, listen and take action. Do not delay. You hear that? You hear the psalmist in there? Don't delay any longer. It's time. Because your city and your people are called by your name. And the answer to Daniel is quite astounding, right? Especially for one who had read Jeremiah who really had a lot of hope with that prayer. It's been 70 years. You said it was going to be 70 years. And what does God answer Daniel in verse 24? He says, not 70 years, Daniel. 70 weeks, 70 sevens is what I have planned for Jerusalem, which is 490 years. 70 weeks have been decreed. And Daniel, I don't want you to expect right now the glory to come back and the full restoration. In fact, he says in verse 25, what's going to happen is... We're going to, they're going to be a decree that's issued. People are going to go back. But in verse 26, the Messiah is actually going to be cut off. He's going to be cut off. He's going to have nothing. The city and sanctuary are going to be destroyed again. And there's going to be flood. There's going to be war, desolations. And sacrifices, verse 27, are going to be cut off once again. So not at all the answer Daniel was expecting. Right? He really, I mean... Based on what you had read in Moses, the next thing after that was we are going to be restored. God's going to make, we're going to be His people, and He's going to everlasting blessing because we're going to have this new heart. And God says that's not the plan, Daniel. That's not what's coming next. Now I mentioned that the latter prophets spoke a lot about this restoration. I mentioned Jeremiah talked about the what, the new covenant, right? He, he said what was going to happen. Isaiah talked about who, uh, the Messiah, and who He was going to make the covenant through. And Ezekiel talked about where it was going to happen, right? Well, there was another latter prophet. I mentioned them. There the 12. There are 12 separate books in our Bible, but there was really one book. And they really speak to the when, the when of that's going to happen. And, and turn with me to Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament. The very last chapter of Malachi, the very last chapter of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And Malachi is going to confirm what Daniel just heard. He's going to confirm that it's not time. In fact, if we think back, that awful day of judgment, the awful day of judgment that was going to, was going to punish Israel and the nations, but ultimately lead to the morning of that day, which was the morning M-O-R, not M-O-U-R, the, the, the brightness of the restoration. All the prophets before 
uh, all these latter prophets said, hey, that day is, is coming really soon. As they saw <laughs> Babylon coming, they identified that. They said, that's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord's near. You can see all of those I have lifted, listed there, all the, the latter prophets. They all made it very plain that the day of the Lord was was near, especially if we had time, and we'll, we'll study this in Old Testament survey when we come back around to it, especially Zephaniah and his portrayal of the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord was near, and read in Malachi. This is Malachi was 100, 200 years after uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, and uh, the, the post-exilic community had come back. The people, like the psalmist in Psalm 74, had come back. And look at what Malachi says to them about timing, if they're asking how long. He says in verse 4, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And again, if you, if, you are a post, if you are the psalmist, you might say, Wait a second, no, the day of the Lord was back then. It was back then. It was what happened to Babylon. It was to us from Babylon. It's what happened to Babylon by Medo-Persia. The day of the Lord came. Now it's time for restoration. And God says through Malachi, no, I'm going to send Elijah. All right? Elijah was the one we thought the covenant was going to come to previously where God did not renew it. He says, I'm going to send Elijah before the day of the Lord comes with the day of the Lord's future. That was an awful day, Malachi would say. God would say to Malachi, that was a terrible day. It was awful destruction. But that was not the day of the Lord. And restoration is not coming right away. So remember the law of Moses and wait, is what Malachi would say. So that's what the faithful remnant did. That's what the psalmist did. They waited. They waited and waited. Back to Psalm 74. And I know we're flipping around. Uh, back to Psalm 74. They waited, they prayed, they prayed like Daniel did. Don't, don't delay, please, don't be mad forever. Remember, wait, we're waiting, please. He says in verse 9 of Psalm 74, there are no more signs. That word sign is the Hebrew word oat. It's the same word as the, the ten plagues. In other words, we don't see the miracles. Like God you know, used to dwell among us and there were miracles being done. He would defeat our enemies with miracles. We don't see that anymore. There's no none of the miracles are happening anymore. There's not a prophet. There's nobody that's able to speak from God. Remember in that post exilic period after Malachi, four hundred years without any prophet. There's none of us none among us who know how long. We know we're waiting. How long, God? When? How long will the adversary revile? Will it be forever? But we know a prophet did come, right? Who came? John the Baptist, John the Baptist came. <clears throat> Right? Finally, the silence is broken. John the Baptist comes. He declares the kingdom is what? It's here. It's near. It's near. You've been waiting. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is near. And after John, the great prophet, more than a prophet, the Son of God, Jesus comes, right? With what? Not just prophecies, but with miracles and signs. Right? It's time, it seems. It's time. But it wasn't time, right? He's killed by his own people that he came. He's killed, and, and you say, what is going on? What in the world? And you say, well, that was planned too, right? I mean, Daniel 9 said the Messiah was going to be cut off. You look at the early preaching of the apostles in Acts 2, 23. What, is, what does Peter say? He said, this death of the Messiah was according to the predetermined plan of God. It may have seemed like time, but no, God planned to, nail, to have you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put Jesus to death. That was delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. But after Christ was killed and resurrected and ascended, God poured out the Holy Spirit, right? Prophecies didn't end. Prophets were there. The apostles were prophesying. There were miracles being done. And, and listen to what Peter said in his early preaching, right? He says, hey, all these things you see, they may seem abnormal because they haven't been happening. You may think, well, that's just the only, the only time I've ever seen anybody act like that is when they're drunk. No, they're not drunk. This is what was prophesied by, by Joel about the day of the Lord coming. It's going to come to pass in the last days that I'll, I'll pour out my spirit. I'm going to grant wonders, signs, right? The sun's going to turn to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and glorious 
day of the Lord shall come. So Peter's saying, hey, this is in fulfillment of those, right? Acts 3.19, he says, repent. Repent. Return so that your sins may be wiped away so that the times of refreshing may come and that he can send Jesus so that Jesus can come back, restore all things. And that was the apostles' message and those were the signs. And it sure seemed like everything was set up that that was the time for the restoration to happen and Christ to come back soon. But decades went by, right? Decades went by and believers began to wonder. Right? I mean, the early believers, they were quitting their jobs. And Paul was having to tell them, look, no, 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 you need to work. Right? You need to work. They were quitting their jobs. And and over time, they began to wonder, you know, is what's going to happen? Is, is this going to come? And 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul actually has to write to them and say, look, I, I don't want you to be shaken from your composure. I don't want you to be disturbed, you know? regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus, as if the day of the Lord has already come. People were saying, well, we must have missed it. It must have come already. And Paul says, don't be shaken. Remain steadfast in your faith. It has not come yet. It can't have come. And he lays out his reasons. But the the believers were, were growing impatient. 2 Timothy 2.18. People were saying, people like uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who were, had gone away from the truth, they were saying the resurrection has already taken place. It's already happened, and they're upsetting the faith of some. It was hard for people to remain when the signs were beginning to diminish, right? Remember Paul? I mean, they were when Jesus was on earth, there were no sick people around. When Peter and them were walking by, their shadows would cast on people, they were healed. But then Paul, at the end of his life, says, you know, take a little wine for your stomach, right? I know you've been sick. The signs were beginning to diminish. The prophets were dying off the scene. Prophecy, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, was going to cease. And these believers are are wondering. And then comes what? In 70 AD, the destruction of Rome, the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome. What could rightly be called a day of the Lord? I mean, it was a lot of the prophecies, even in the New Testament, made you think this is the destruction that God had planned. This is the day of the Lord by the Romans. And so... So maybe God's going to come now, right? The judgment came. Now it's time for restoration. But decades went by again, and and, and nothing happened. The, the apostles started to die. Peter was killed. You know, early days, he'd get put in jail, and what would happen? He's freed. He gets out. But no, Peter was crucified. He's killed. And, and John's getting old. And I heard that John wasn't going to die. <clears throat> Right? There was a rumor that John wasn't going to die. And he's old. What's happening? And John actually writes his gospel to deal with this. John writes his gospel because in, in his gospel he's contrasting Judas, who didn't remain in the faith, with the apostles who wouldn't have remained in the faith if it wasn't for God's keeping and specifically for Jesus' high priestly prayer to keep them. But they're going to remain because of Jesus' keeping. And he says in John 20, 31, and as he tells the purpose of his gospel, I've written these things. There's lots of other things I could tell you. But this is enough. I've written these things so that you'll keep believing and have life. Don't be like Judas. And in John 21, a chapter that people question why it's there, John has told his purpose. He feels like the gospel's done. And then he writes this chapter where he, he talks about Peter on the beach and how he's restored after his... Um, denial of Christ and he he predicts Peter's death and he corrects the misconception that John's going to die. Why, what is that? Why did he put that there? Well, it seems clear enough that John's doing that to help these believers because a lot of believers were walking away and John's saying, hey, Peter could be forgiven. Don't come back and don't be upset that Peter died. That was planned by God. He knew it was going to happen. He even told Peter how it was going to happen. Like, don't let that shake your faith. And by the way, the whole rumor about me, it's not what he said. He didn't say that. He just said, if I wanted you to stay till I remain, I could do that. I didn't say that's what was going to happen. So so John writes late in the first century to these believers to say, don't worry. Stay steadfast. Don't give up the faith. I understand the prophets are gone. I understand the signs are gone. Don't worry. Keep in the faith. 
But now it hasn't, I heard Andre say this earlier, it hasn't just been decades, right? It's been centuries, it hasn't even just been century, it's been millennia, millennia. right? Since we've had prophets and signs. I know, um, I'm not saying there's never uh, any miracles that are done, I don't believe that, but there's no one with the gift of miracles. There's no one that's walking around healing people today. And, and there's no signs of the, the Lord's redemption of Israel, and it's been thousands of years. And if it was hard decades after to remain faithful and to recognize that God may have a plan, man, 2,000 years later, and, and I don't, what do I have? Yeah, I have it up. Um, I'm looking in my reflection so I can see what's on the screen. Second uh, Peter 3, which we'll cover shortly, Peter says, look, you know what's going to happen is days are going to come when people say, all that stuff was made up. All that stuff was made up. It's been, it's been years ever since the world was made. Everything's just the same. There's no signs. There's no wonders. There's no miracles, and they're going to begin to mock. And you can imagine 2,000 years after that we're in danger of that, right? I know we're believers here, but we're in danger of that. It can, it can be hard to, to say, is, this, is, is God going to restore Israel? In fact, there's a, there are uh, believers who will say, no, they're not. Right? We're in that. We're in the kingdom right now. Right? The resurre- there are preterists who will say the resurrection happened. Right? And we're saying, no, don't give up. It's coming. Wait. Right? It's going to come. But Peter said people are going to be- begin mocking. Paul said people are going to say the resurrection's already happened. Paul's going to say people are going to say the day of the Lord's already come, that the kingdom is here. And it's going to upset people's faith, Paul said. So is it possible Israel is still going to be redeemed and that the remnant just need to keep waiting? How can we know what would be helpful for us here? Well, remember how John ended his gospel, the gospel where he encouraged believers to continue in the faith despite signs ending, prophecy diminishing. He ended it by showing his readers that what was happening, Judas's apostasy, remember in the gospel, very clear in John. Jesus knew from the beginning, right? That wasn't a surprise to him. Judas's apostasy, Peter's death. I knew it. I predicted it beforehand. He knew and declared ahead of time that those things were going to happen so that later believers could say, okay, I don't need to struggle. I don't need to worry. God knew that. He even wrote it down. I can stay. So are the 2,000 years in which we found ourselves since the coming of Christ something that God knew about and declared in advance? If so, that would be helpful in our waiting. It would help us not grow weary in our faith, but continue knowing that God was working out what he planned. It would help us not, again, these are brothers, these are friends, but it would help us not embrace uh, systems like, well, it's not going to happen. It's actual. It's actually that, uh, that we are in the kingdom. There is no kingdom, amillennialism. You know, we're going to bring the kingdom, postmillennialism, right? Uh, it would be helpful if we knew that God had actually planned these 2,000 years and had written it down for us to know and that Israel's restoration is and, and Christ's coming is future. And my claim to you is that they were written about in advance. They were known, everyone would know, yeah, these were known by God. No one, uh, well, open theists do, but no one else uh, doesn't think God knows the future, right? We know it, but did God write it down for us? And my claim to you is he did, that they were written about Specifically in the 12, which again I mentioned are written to answer the question of when. Written specifically in the 12, specifically in Hosea, which is the head of the 12, the starting of the 12. And specifically in Hosea 3. And in my estimation, it's written with a clarity that is sufficient to make very plain that these are the years that God intended and that this is all his plan to sustain the faith of those like us who are living 2,000 years since the last prophets and signs and God were given. And to, to make it very clear, again, not diminishing in any way my brothers and sisters who hold differently, but in my estimation, very plain that God's plan, his premillennial plan, his plan to re- return in the last days and, and, and set up a kingdom for Israel, very plain and very clear. And again, seeing that God knew about this in advance, and and did those who read them initially, are we smarter than those who read them initially? No, but is prophecy easier sometimes to look back on and see? 
Right, what did the prophets, I don't think I'm any, I'm not more godly than the prophets. I'm not going to claim that, right? What did the prophets do with their writings? They searched them. They searched them. Why did they search them? Try They're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure it out, right? But now we are, 2,000 years later, looking at Hosea 3, and we can see that God planned and wrote down ahead of time of these days and of the ones to come. And that's the prophecy that we're going to study in the two weeks to come. So there's the plan. That's what we completed today. We, we provided some context to help us understand the importance of Hosea 3 and what, why we might want to study it and what we might could expect to learn from it. Psalm 79 will be on Wednesday. It's, a, again, a very similar psalm where the, the community is saying, God, have you forgotten? When? Right? So it'll just be good context for us. Next week, Hosea 3, again, good, godly, intelligent people disagree on, on that interpretation of that prophecy. But there's two clues that I think can, can help us to really get to the, the truth of the prophecy. We're going to look at those two clues next Sunday. And, and, and start to think about the prophecy. The following Wednesday, we'll look at Hosea 2. Again, everybody, well, not everybody, a lot of us know the story of Hosea and Gomer. It's easy to understand. It's a story. Uh, that's 1 and 3. Hosea 2 is a, a song, a poem. It's, it's prophetic literature. It's not as easy. So we'll look at that a little bit on Wednesday just to give us a head start on the harder part. And then two weeks from now, we'll study Hosea 3 and answer the question as well as, uh, again, take away some application on seeing the character of God, how it could impact us personally. So that's the plan. Uh, I'm going to pray for us. We'll uh, have a time of fellowship, and then Frank will teach us from the life of Christ. So let's pray together. God, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for, uh, like a, a better, but like a good parent, you know, thinking ahead and knowing what people will need to sustain their faith. And revealing that ahead of time, showing your omniscience, showing your plan, showing that you have everything uh, determined and planned, and we need not fear, and we certainly need not turn away uh, thinking that you're not real or that you've, uh, your plan has failed or any such thing. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for providing your Holy Spirit, again, as a good father, knowing that you didn't want to leave us as orphans as Jesus returned and you provided your Holy Spirit. Lord, you've given all these things to us, everything that we need, as David has taught us, everything we need for life and godliness. And we're, we're, we're so thankful for that. And as, Father, we uh, wait and remain and, and, and look forward to and long for uh, the restoration of Israel and all the blessings that will come with that, the worldwide blessings that come with that, even... Father, even our being caught up to be with you, God, help us to remain faithful. Help us to look at these things and to, to have them be like rocks underneath our feet so that we're not moved, Father, when we don't see signs and we don't see wonders and there's confusion and we don't know how long. And God, help us to be sustained by your word. Help us to, as we do it, to love each other, Father. To not be idle. I think of the Thessalonians who were also looking forward to your return, but were being idle and busybodies and not working and not serving each other. God, help us to, to love each other, to bear each other's burdens, to care for each other, and to do so until you do come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can stand with us. We're going to sing one song before we have that time of fellowship.